So 1973, I'm sitting in a beanbag chair in the basement of our split entry home in Fruit Heights, Utah, eating a bag of Doritos and watching an episode of Gilligan's Island. When all of a sudden I hear the front door open and shut, and the next thing I know, my dad, Doug Bryan, is standing right next to me. Now, that might, not, that might not seem like that shocking of an event to most of you, but you need to understand, my dad was a mechanical engineer, and he was starting his own business for as long as I can remember. So if the sun was out, that guy was at work. We looked down at me, and he said, Michael, you want to go grab some dinner with me? I was stunned. I'd never been anywhere alone with my dad, let alone to dinner. So I jumped to my feet and I scrambled out that screen door and jumped in the passenger seat of our green 1963 Dodge D100 truck. We actually called this truck the Fodge because it had a Dodge hood and a Ford tailgate. <laughs> this thing was a legend in our neighborhood. So we went to my dad's favorite restaurant. It's a little pizza place called Robentino's. But what he really loved there was this huge Roquefort blue cheese salad. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but to a 10-year-old, that's like eating a bowl of throw-up. <laughs> but I was having the time of my life, dinner alone with my hero. Now, after dinner was over, we started heading to the truck, and when we were in the parking lot, he put his arm around my shoulder, and he said, so, Michael, tell me about Bigfoot. Now, in the 1970s, Bigfoot was kind of a big deal. He was showing up all over the country, making his way on the news nearly every night, getting in sitcoms and movies. But what I didn't know is that my mother had had several other mothers in the neighborhood call her and complain that their kids would no longer go outside and play because Michael Bryan told them and convinced them that he saw Bigfoot in his backyard. <laughs> well, my dad asked me, so I decided I'd tell him the story. I said, well, Dad, a few weeks ago I was feeding the dog and I put the lid on the food can and I was walking back across the grass and I saw him out of the corner of my eye. He was standing in a grove of trees at the edge of our yard. And I was home alone and I was really scared so I didn't want him to attack me so I pretended I didn't see him and I slowly walked across the grass until I got into the house. I grabbed my BB gun and I hid under my bed until mom got home. He didn't say a word to me the rest of the way home. We pulled in our driveway, he put on the emergency brake, turned off the truck, and then wham! He hit both of his hands on the dash and screamed, oh my gosh, there he is! And he pointed out into the darkness. Well, I whipped over to see what he was looking at, and when I looked back, that guy disappeared through the front door and the screen door slammed shut. Well, I panicked, I locked my door, scrambled to the driver's side, locked his door, and I grabbed onto the steering wheel. And right then I looked up and my bedroom light turned on and there was my poor dear mother with her hands cupped like this on the window, the look of terror on her face. Five seconds later, my dad jumped off a boulder between two bushes on the corner of our house and landed on the hood of the truck. <laughs> when I came to, I realized that I had both of my arms locked down on the horn of the truck and they were both my mom and dad banging on the window trying to get me to stop. This might have been the first sleepless night of my young life. You know, the next morning, really early, my dad came in and he sat on the edge of my bed. And he looked down at me and he said, well, Michael, did you learn anything last night? And I sat right up and I said, yes, I did. You saw him back there too, didn't you? <laughs> this was the moment that I learned that I might actually have the makings of a superpower. Not a supernatural power like Superman or Wonder Woman, more of a superhuman power like Batman or Iron Man. Now, I didn't have the kind of money they did, but I didn't let that stop me. I spent the next 30 years studying, researching, and cultivating the storyteller superpower. I work with Fortune 100 company executives and mom pa entrepreneurs, helping them find and craft and deliver their stories with more impact and greater success. And over that time, I conducted a bunch of research, trying to figure out why do stories work so well. And Paul Zak, he published an article of a research project that he did explaining this. The human brain releases chemicals, three specific ones when we hear a story. The first one is cortisol, and cortisol is designed to get your attention. It wakes you up and gets you engaged in what's going on and focuses you. The second chemical is dopamine, and that's the arousal drug. That gets our emotions involved. 
The third chemical is oxytocin. And when oxytocin is released, these three chemicals working together ignite and fuel your imagination. So think about it. When I told you my story, could you see me sitting down in that basement, bag of Doritos, watching TV? Could you envision my dad, Doug Bryan, standing over the top of me? Or the green fudge truck? Or the huge Roquefort blue cheese salad? Or my dad flying through the air and landing on the hood of the truck? You see, I gave you enough specifics, details, to build a framework, a structure. But you drew upon your own experiences and your own background to fill in all the blanks and color the scenes. And by so doing, you made my Bigfoot story your Bigfoot story. Another really interesting article was by Jerome Bruner. He published an article expressing that messages delivered within a story are recalled 22 times more often than facts and figures alone. And when it comes to behavior, nearly 80% of the human decision-making process is emotions. You know, a few years ago, a company went to a university, conducted a presentation where they talked to the students about Match.com. And they told them about how successful they were with charts and graphs and really amazing figures. And they told one story during this presentation about Gary Kremen. He's the founder of Match.com. And in this story, he asked all of his staff if they would create a profile. After all, Match.com wouldn't work without a profile. So everybody made a profile, and a few weeks later, he realized how powerful his website was going to be when one of his employees, his girlfriend, found a new match on Match.com. The researchers came back after a couple months and they surveyed all the students. And they found that only 5% of the students could recall any of the statistics from their presentation. While 63% of them remembered the story and the details that were delivered within the story. So now I figured like I understood why stories work. I got that. What I was really perplexed with is how do stories work? How come some stories are great and some stories aren't? And it happened for me sitting in a dark theater in 1993 with a hoodie on watching Sleepless in Seattle. How many of you have seen this movie? Okay. It's not exactly my genre, but it was my wife's turn to pick, so I was being a good sport, and there I was. I would vowed I wasn't going to get involved in this movie. First of all, I had much bigger fish to fry. So I'm sitting there in the dark. All of a sudden, halfway through this movie, I was in. Hook, line, and sinker. And I slapped myself awake and said, what, how did that happen? And that's when I saw it. The movie split into three different pieces. The music and sound effects, the action, the characters, and the cinematography, and the storyline. Well, I went back the next three nights, this time without my hoodie, but I had a pad of paper and a pen. And I drew the pattern of each of those elements individually on a timeline. And there it was. I laid them on top of each other, and I could see a pattern. And then I couldn't unsee it. Every movie, musicals, plays, books, music, even really good comedians use these patterns to tell their jokes. And I call these patterns cadence. And this is the cadence of Bigfoot. Now, I know some of you are sitting out there thinking, oh, great, well, I'm never going to be able to do that. Well, I'm going to show you how to do it tonight, and you're going to be able to do it tomorrow. So the first thing you have to do is document the story. In a short story, you're looking for these 10 basic elements, okay? These are 10 things that will help you guide your way through the story, but you have to document them. I use what I call a story grid. It's a simple spreadsheet, Excel or whatever, and I, I create that sheet to capture them so that I can record them. When you're doing this, you're looking for something that will help you identify, do I even have a story? There's two elements that you need to find. The first one is the climax, or an apex of the story. Without that, you don't really have a story. Something amazing, something fantastic, or something terrible. The second thing you're looking for is going to be the lesson. And the lesson of that story is something that will help you teach something. So in my story, my dad landing on the hood of that truck was a climax of the story. The lesson I was teaching is that storytelling is a superpower. And then what you do is you pull those elements, once you have them all crafted, and you put them on this document. This is called a cadence chart. Now, let me walk through this really quickly. First thing I do before I put the 10 elements on is I give the story a name. So up in the top corner, I put the name, something that you'll always remember, like Bigfoot in the backyard, 
okay? The next thing you do is put the category down in the bottom corner. Who or when would I use this story? On the other side, I put the lesson, something that I learned or something I can teach from that story. Right above that is where I put the timeline. This is a percentage of time, okay? Stories are longer and shorter, so it's better to use a percentage. Right above that is where I put the emotional status, the feelings I want to generate with the audience while I'm presenting to them at any given point throughout the presentation. Right above that is a little red line called the emotional baseline. This is the axis that you use to move the rhythm of your presentation on the cadence. Above that line is where I put the details, the little specifics, the things that will help you tell the story and help people get their imagination involved. Then at the top of the graph, along the top, I put those other eight elements right along the top, and then I drop this cadence line on, and it works every single time. You know, a few years after Bigfoot happened, my mom's 44th birthday, she just made a birthday cake, as mothers do to celebrate, and we were heading over to my sister's house to celebrate her birthday. And we were over there working on my sister's brand new house. They were just putting the shingles on the roof and finishing up. Right as we pulled in, the wind gust knocked a few bags off the top of that roof. They slid down and swept my dad off the two-story home, and we lost him. But you met him tonight. You met him. He lives on in those stories in my life, in the life of my wife and my kids and my grandkids, even though none of them ever met him, including Remy, my grandson that was born at 11 o'clock this morning down in Arizona. Stories are the bond of humanity. Stories connect us throughout our lives, and I believe forever. So tonight, I challenge you, find one story. Document it, write it down, cultivate it, and share it. And then do it again, and then do it again. Start tonight and develop yourself so that you can become a storytelling superhero. Because you and your stories can make a difference in the world. But you have to share them. Good night.